Have a great time. Just, just. <laughs> and you. Yeah. Ta -da. Did it work? Ta -da. Yes. It says it's live on Facebook. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello. And let me see. Ben, it doesn't say it started. Where is the video? Yes, yes, we are live. And my Hello. Imogen, I had a moment where I realized that was a mirror and I wanted to see you do that thing, you know, where you stand halfway <laughs> behind it and you go like this. I don't know. I don't know what you mean. What do I? You stand and you put one arm out. We are live, by the way. Oh, I've, I've seen you. Yeah. Officially up and going. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the panel <laughs> on intimacy and improv. We're already having a really, really great time. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us. If you're joining us live or for watching it later and for your interest, yay! Kudos to you. Uh, we are. Um, speakers uh, and our speakers will introduce themselves for in, in just a moment but first of all I will ask you from time to time to type something in the chat um, give your feedback ask your questions please please do that because yeah we will try and, and come back to you um, as soon as possible. The Facebook li uh, live stream is delayed by about 20 seconds, just so you know that we don't get to your comments immediately. That doesn't mean that we're ignoring you. It's just, yeah, we are in the future compared to you. <laughs> <laughs> and we are going to have a great time. Hope you will enjoy this too. And here, here they are. These, these three gorgeous women, if you could please say something, um, your name and, and who you are, yes. Shall I go first? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, uh, hello everybody, my name is Lucy Fennell, my pronouns are she, her, um, and I, I'm an improviser and a facilitator, teacher, and uh, most recently have trained in intimacy direction with uh, intimacy for stage and screen. So uh, yeah, pandemic is the, not the best time to train in intimacy. So I really picked my timing, but uh, yeah, that's me. Yay. Thank you, Lucy. Um, Imogen? Yeah, hello. Um, I'm Imogen Palmer. My pronouns are she, her. And uh, yeah, I am an improviser, a teacher, a director. Um, I'm the theatre school manager at the Bristol Improv Theatre in the UK and the artistic director of a company called The Delight Collective. And uh, prior to um, sort of taking my performing career seriously, I worked in student unions, so uh, where there was a lot of work on liberation and inclusivity. So I've taken that political interest uh, with me throughout my performing career, and I'm really excited to chat to um, some amazing uh, women about about intimacy and how we can um, do that skillfully in the improv and performing world. Yes. Beautiful. Jeremy. Hi, I'm Jeremy Daglider. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm a member of the Barcelona Improv Group. I teach. I'm an improviser um, and a, a director of plays, an artist and a visual artist. Um, and really, I I have had an interest in uh, connection uh, f for years now. I started taking martial arts in my mid twenties and uh, realized um, how subtle our energy is as humans and how we're connected. Um, and have been exploring that idea in terms of improv in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, I'm Irina, Irina Wilder, my pronouns uh, are she, her, and I'm an improviser and director and, and teacher based in Gothenburg, Sweden. 
And to start off this panel, let's let's um, start with something very, very simple. Um, what is maybe not one thing, but if there is one thing that would be great, what do you know now about intimacy and improv that you wish you knew when you just started improvising? I don't want to embarrass Lucy, but I wish I'd known Lucy when I started. Um, because <laughs> this year she's given me lots of language around um, boundaries and consent, um, mm -hmm. which, uh, which I think when I started improv, I definitely fell into that camp of, oh, freedom, what are boundaries? I don't know. Yes, and accept everything. And so um, and I look back at some instances where I maybe overrode someone's boundaries and I didn't know that um, at the time and I regret that and wish I knew more and then also times when I experienced the other side of that and had uncomfortable instances. Um, so yeah, I wish I'd had that language around boundaries, consent and containers, which I'm sure we'll get into, um, that I've been, I've been lucky enough to learn this mm -hmm. year. Yes, so language, vocabulary, and an intimacy director whom you know. Yeah, I mean, it, I get it. <laughs> just, just always in your pocket. <laughs> perfect. That's perfect. Lucy, yeah. I, I saw your, your eyebrows going up. So I was just thinking, I wish I'd known, I, I didn't know that stuff until very recently mm. either. So um, I could have done with knowing that when I started mm. uh, improv as well. Um, my first ever improv lesson uh, workshop was brilliant, but I was kissed on the lips full on in that first ever session, you know, so, um, but I still kept coming back to doing it. But uh, yeah, I think uh, combined with youth as well, um, it can make for a very volatile situation, very dangerous situation, can't it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the only other thing I guess I would add is that, um, I guess I wish I'd known that some of there's uh, some of the admin techniques that you can do to prevent this stuff in the first place. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. For example, you know, not that long ago. Again, I think as well, there's a lot of things you brought that up, Imogen, but that feeling of regret and that feeling of having pos pushed other people's boundaries and gone there when uh, you shouldn't have done. We've all made mistakes and will continue to do so. Uh, mm -hmm. I made mistakes until very recently, you know, like as in last Monday, I made a mistake in a class as well. So like uh, we we're constantly learning and nobody has learned it all and has suddenly changed. So um, mm -hmm. what am I trying to say? Uh, the admin around it. So like uh, when I was teaching some young people who, who were adults, but young adults um, and in a, in a theatre class and kind of using improv in that session, I would turn up and spontaneously do a session on intimacy um, from an improv, a very light session on intimacy. These were students who were doing uh, theatre and education around sex education, you know, and I would bring up stuff to do with intimacy on the hoof. And actually, really, the etiquette and the much kinder, better thing to do is to let people know that that's the content you're going to be covering a week, two weeks ahead of time. And that's such a simple <laughs> adjustment to make, isn't it, is that courtesy around these things actually uh, empowers our uh, fellow creatives and the people that we're working with. That was a very long way of saying a very short thing. But... <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> yes. um, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I have quite a number of years on both of you. And when I started improv, I felt compelled to say yes, because I wanted to be involved. Mm -hmm. and I wanted to I wanted to learn and I wanted to fit in so uh, I, I wasn't going to say no um, for me intimacy isn't just physicality um, it's uh, it can be uh, just that energetic connection that we have with someone else and that can also be uh, uh, disregarded and uh, used inappropriately. I think mm -hmm. as women, we've all felt that kind of icky oh. sexual energy that's directed at us and nothing has to be said. And uh, I've learned so much uh, also just in the past since quarantine and I've been introduced to Imogen and Lucy 
um, and the ICC and all of this language that I, I also had no idea was out there. So I'm so grateful for all of these tools. Um, and yeah, I have the same sort of regrets, Imogen, of like, mm -hmm. oh, if, if I had known. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm grateful to still be learning and, mm -hmm. and to be able to have this conversation. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, I want to follow up on that, but I want to actually use this opportunity and ask our audience, if you're watching this live, please write in, in, in the chat, how would you define intimacy? What, what does this word mean, mean to you? And it could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be psychological. Just give it a think and um, type, it, type it down. Um, but it's, it's interesting that all of you mentioned two things. So one is having a vocabulary to define things that you see, to define things that are happening requires actually like to notice them, you, you have to have those terms. Um, um, but the second thing is having an opportunity to learn from someone. So like this pandemic, as horrible as it is, has given us both the time and um, the access to resources, right? To the educators, to workshops who that, that maybe contribute some knowledge that we did not have before. Um, right, so based on the vocabulary that you have right now, what would be the, the resource that you would immediately recommend? Like this is where you start learning about intimacy and improv or in, in performance arts in general. And it's a leading question. Uh, it is, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think I would say that I think intimacy and improv as a, well, the bringing intimacy direction and a formal way of looking at uh, the way we navigate and negotiate spontaneous intimacy feels quite new, but maybe it just feels new to me. I don't know. And I don't know everybody's improv landscapes and worlds and maybe uh, and, and obviously I would love to uh, Rama's doing great work and you know I'd love to meet other people who are doing this but um, just in terms of even looking at intimacy from a scripted point of view and looking at, at firstly so that we can then apply that to improv um, I've obviously learned with intimacy for stage and screen um, which is a wonderful company improv uh, intimacy company but there are other other companies out there and, and different places worldwide but they uh, recently came up with some guidelines that um, were worked through with the women's committee at equity and have excellent comprehensive uh, glossaries and stuff around working with intimacy in live performance which they acknowledge isn't just scripted work, you know, live performance encompassing all sorts. Uh, there's a link, I believe, uh, yes, just uh, which is going, yes, which is going into the chat now. So I encourage you to have a look at that resource. Yeah. Great, fantastic. We we have a few questions, uh, a few responses, sorry. Um, and, and they were, uh, different but all the beautiful like feeling safe with someone is 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 intimacy um knowing someone as in willing to listen and work with 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 them and with my boundaries uh intimacy is something very personal and um <laughs> i really like the 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 definition um of sharing a part of yourself mm. with someone and, and it's interesting how, how philosophical that sounds, but it's also, it could be, even if it's very physical, it still means that you're vulnerable to some extent. You're sharing something that maybe you wouldn't do in a, in a, in a normal public business setting. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, if I might get back to the question of what have we learned now that we 
did not have the language before. For me, a revelation was how much power dynamics uh, plays into um, into our relationships with consent and saying yes and and being ready for everything, as all of us said. Like yes, this is our training, either from theater or or from our very first class from Improv 101. Um, and again, for the audience who, for people who are watching us live, if you could write down what kind of examples, what kind of power dynamics have you observed in your theaters or in your schools, current or previous, um, someone who is artistic director or a director of a show, someone who has a lot of experience or a lot of connections versus someone who does not have that experience, those connections, that position. How does that play around? How many people in each position do you have? How many different power dynamics you have? But the question that I have for this panel was actually, um, how do you think that power dynamic and the different interplays, the different intersections of, of different types of power affect our reflexes to say yes, to be the good girl or the good boy or the, the good non-binary improviser and just say, yeah, I'm ready for everything. How does power affects us? I'll go if you want. I just, I don't want to speak over anybody. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess. Uh, I was going to say as well, if people are putting things in the comments, maybe we should say no names, keep it general and hypothetical, hypothetical power dynamic situation. Mm, um, purely hypothetical. Yeah, um, I, I, I guess, yeah, it's a revelation for me as well, um, noticing these things. And I think when I hear the word, when I heard the word, the phrase power dynamics, I initially really thought of it as a really negative thing. And actually, uh, it's been quite freeing to just acknowledge that power dynamics are a thing. And we don't have to, obviously there are um, terrible abuses of power that go on and, and, and all of that, but uh, just power dynamics are a thing. We have a power dynamic happening now while we're having this chat and that's that's that. And we just need to be aware of the, the fact it's happening. Um, yeah, so, but but yeah, power dynamics that we observe in all sorts of scenarios in, in the arts and in the world, in the improv world that we're, we're in. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did either of you two have any thoughts on that? Uh, um, I um, it's something that makes me really curious, and I'm sure we've all done classes in status um, or learnt about status as as part of improv and characterization, and and figure out who has the power in the room and who maybe has less power. And the way I see this interplay, uh, like like Lucy and Arena have said, being mindful of those dynamics um, can be really valuable because sometimes it can be very subconscious and we're not quite aware. Um, and particularly as teachers and practitioners, um, I don't know if I found the right word for it yet, but there can be this halo glow. And I think maybe I'm influenced by the light above my head that I haven't done on purpose. <laughs> but there can be this halo glow around the, the improv teacher for a lot of students. So mm -hmm. a lot of the beginners on the uh, on the courses I teach um, can get a bit dazzled by their improv teacher because they and they want to, like Irina said, they want to impress the improv teacher. And, and I think there's a real uh, potential to get like improv teacher crushes because <laughs> because they you know you're the you're the gateway keeper to this beautiful art form which is all about freedom and expression and it's gorgeous um, and being mindful that as directors and as teachers I I think is really really important because um, because some students are very vulnerable and. Um, and some teachers consciously or subconsciously can uh, abuse that vulnerability or that trust. Um, not, in, not always in that, in the sort of, a um, lot of scandals went out in America, the American schools in the past few years, post Me Too, um, which were really important voices and stories to be heard. Um, but also just in little ways, like um, not noticing, pushing a student to do something and, and not quite picking up that they weren't quite ready for that thing or whatever it is. Um, and I just, yeah, I think being mindful that 
that that it is a power dynamic and you're in charge and that your some of your students are vulnerable and they don't know their own boundaries they don't know their boundaries and i'm sure we'll get onto that but um loads of people don't know that boundaries are a thing and that they have them <laughs> and it's part of our responsibility as the person with the power in the room to give them the opportunity to examine their own boundaries and be able to articulate those and be mindful of our halo glow i think i don't know what other people think of that i think that's so well said absolutely um uh, i mean uh as much as a year ago um i i took a class with stephen davidson and he was like leave the stage leave the stage if if you're uncomfortable or you don't feel uh you can leave for any reason and i've been doing improv not as long as some but longer than some others and had never occurred to me just hadn't occurred to me oh we can leave the stage so um just even having that permission was um a huge thing towards uh saying how much of this power can we while we're keeping our students safe and as imogen said uh, being aware of helping people discover their own boundaries and be learn their boundaries be mindful to protect people even when they might not be protecting themselves giving as much permission as possible to to take the up the the opportunity you need to protect yourself mm -hmm. and learning that that's a thing you can do mm -hmm. um and it's if you don't know that it's something you can do you don't know to teach it so uh still learning <laughs> i am um, i think it's so yeah that's a fantastic lesson from stephen isn't it and uh, stephen davidson is doing some absolutely fantastic work uh, along with monica gaga as well um in inclusion which has huge overlaps of intimacy and and, and his work on boundaries and, and all of that and yeah absolutely jeremy it hadn't occurred to me and i think um i'm just watching the chat at the same time but nora raised a really interesting point about can you really leave as a pro um i think uh, nora raises a really good point around we're talking very generally about intimacy and improv but it's worth acknowledging that improv is a lot of things to a lot of different things to a lot of different people isn't it for some people it's a real fun hobby um for other people i think it's vaguely therapeutic um, for other people, it's uh, an art form that's a professional performance genre, um, you know, and, and I think intimacy and the way we navigate it will be vaguely you know, different depending on what slice of that world we're, we're tapping into. Um, and yeah, leaving, leaving the stage, I think, is legitimate as a, a learner a legitimate as a pro as well and i think we have that we have that fantastic I, I think it's legitimate as a performer in a scripted show on the west end if you find your boundaries are being um uh, broken you know in that moment i think if your safety needs to come first and and that certainly follows the learning i've had so um but we have the benefit in improv that if you want to leave the stage the entire story can divert in a different direction we can call a blackout we can end that story we can jump in and make make it make sense if we need to you know depending on what's happened so yeah uh i, I think that's that's something i was going to say something else um even though we we're talking about power dynamics but it kind of gone on to onto something oh yes just okay just that i think that it, we've, it would be wonderful to embed these ideas of leaving the stage and boundaries and checking in as just the normal base level for all improv going forward. I don't see any reason that it does nothing to detract from anything that's happened already. It only goes to make everything safer and better. And coming back to the thing about pro versus, um, I don't know, kind of hobby hobbyist improvisers, Pro professionals want to do their best work, right? We feel that pressure to say yes, because uh, we want to come to the job and do our best work and give everything we've got and make a wonderful piece of art, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's potentially a pervading perception that uh, 
enforcing boundaries, communicating boundaries, being allowing our vulnerability to influence our boundaries is a weakness. And I think there needs to be an absolute U-turn on that culture of being of, of seeing communicating our boundaries as a delicate weakness that we're not because actually it's the opposite of that by demonstrating our boundaries by having firm no's by being able to discuss this stuff it actually makes us more daring performers um, mm. who are able to go further right in in the good work that we want to do um mm. yeah yeah i yeah. feel strongly about that can i can i, can I go imogen something just to the leaving the stage comment and arena if you want to move us on no go, go ahead yes. time master tonight um but uh i love leaving the stage i love helping people discover their boundaries and own them and and couldn't agree with you more lucy on that culture shift and um, but for me it's always a two-way street and it's always how do we equip individuals to leave but also educate um the person who's done the thing that made that person the like them being mindful that boundaries exist um and give them the tools to be like have i got to this point with this person have we had this trust conversation mm -hmm. did we talk about physicality in this class because yeah it's always a two-way street and something for me sometimes i think we can put the onus on people to be like no and forget the onus on the person who's doing doing the thing that they also need to be aware of that when they're making choices does that make sense yeah. i'm doing that a lot tonight that's a habit of mine does that make sense i don't know <laughs> i love it um so w when we're talking about boundaries there are two things here one is that we've already mentioned that a lot of uh, improvisers for different reasons, either because of their previous training, because of their um, acting background, I certainly fall into that category, or because of their desire to, to please and to look good as a performer, they say, I have no boundaries. I, I'm good with anything. I'm ready to, to do this job. I'm, I'm a good performer, so whatever is required, I'm going to do this. Um, so this is this is one part. And the other part is um, when we as partners see other people having boundaries as difficult for some reason. And I love how Lucy, how you phrased it, um, that when we have the power to say no, it's it's freeing. Um, I love the definition from um, from the ICC the gift of now, the gift of the, these are my boundaries. The, this is what keeps me safe within these boundaries. I can do anything. And this is um, a, an interesting discussion um, how uh, that, that you've already started. How do we flip it? How do we actually um, go from oh no those stupid boundaries and checks and people being overly sensitive uh to no the, this is the, the the preliminary job that you do before you start being creative how do we go about that i i went to a really good talk recently i don't know if you caught it you know i know you've been to a few of, or anybody uh any of the ISS uh, intimacy persuasion screen talks, but there was there's a wonderful intimacy director called Adam Noble, um, mm -hmm. who has a method called the Noble method, um, which he devised initially to help with the issue of students in university sort of uh, theatre school drama school settings having to go off and rehearse duologues together and having no director there or any third party there and um, having to rehearse in corridors and dorm rooms and stuff and so he has and, and this is, he's tried to uh, com combat that by coming up with this method to make it safer and 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 this is this thing as well is that we might not live in a perfect world where we're going to get everything absolutely right but as long as we can make it safer than when we were last doing it then we're making progress right uh anyway one of his big sort of mantras is know thyself right mm -hmm. um so 
this uh, this idea that I think we touched, I can't remember who it was touched on it before about some students don't even know they've got boundaries or that boundaries are, are an option. And, and definitely in my whirlwind learning journey, it's made me have to think about what are my boundaries, but also to acknowledge that boundaries are not just one thing necessarily. There might be some boundaries you have for your whole life, but there are lots of things that it's a very nebulous thing that might change. Uh, we don't we don't have to sometimes boundaries come out of a trauma or come out of something that is very profound that's going to stay but sometimes boundaries are just you sweated more today than you did yesterday and that means you don't want someone in body contact with you or you've just eaten some garlic or uh, you're menstruating or uh, you've had an argument with your other half and you're feeling fragile like there's there's it's a real nebulous thing, right? These, these boundaries. I've lost the track of the question, but I really. <laughs> can I, can no, I show you told me, which is my favorite example of how to communicate boundaries to someone? And I learned this from Lucy, and I, I was hoping you were going to say it. But I don't it might have been, but. But it's, uh, you say to the student, oh, do you have boundaries? And they're like, oh, no, I don't. And then you're like, oh, can I put my finger up your nose then? <laughs> Yes, that was what I was leading to. Thank you so much for knowing what I was I thinking. Love that because that just immediately people are like, oh, oh, okay. Yes, and I, Adam Noble says that's the thing. He said identify. So when you say to the student, and and so many people I've worked with say this, and I probably would have been one of them not that long ago. Of like, do you have any boundaries? Uh, no, I'm I'm all good. I'm all good. Which again, even in that language, implies that someone who has a boundary isn't all good. When they are all good, the you're just a human with a normal boundary like it's fine but he he says to his students okay pick three things and I think um I I made his comment a lot more safe with it being a finger up the nose I think his thing is uh, can I put my finger up your yeah. bum then you know and and it's like well no then that's one boundary you've got cool um he also uses a shorthand of um general boundaries which is this so like if students are negotiating this and uh, you know discussing it they can say general boundaries which uh, alludes to everything that would be under a swimsuit right mm -hmm. so it kind of stops you having to go through the intricacies of um nothing around genitals nothing around my chest whatever um so yeah so i like that as a shorthand um but again i think it comes back into just embedding this in right at the start because if I was a beginner, if any of us had turned up to our first improv lesson and somebody said, right, you're just going to outline the boundaries and you go, oh, OK, that's the thing we do. It's not very normalizing, isn't it? But the other thing I have done is sort of twist it as well and say uh, in this next scene, please tell your scene partner three things that you would be really good for them. So we call them like no go areas or go areas. Right. What's a what's a go for you? So obviously they have to agree to, too. Um, but you could say, Look, I'm OK with hands on my shoulders. I'm good with holding hands and I'm absolutely fine with the cupping of my, my face, provided your scene partner is also happy reciprocating those things um, and is happy putting their hand on your face. Then that's three things you can play with that you didn't know you had before. So it's all just data collection, really, which takes some of the angst out of it, in my opinion. Mm. There's so I many good comments and questions. I I think too uh, that um, if we want to be playing honestly on stage and if we're not honest about what our boundaries are and we're doing things that we're not actually comfortable with, we're not going to be playing honestly. And then, you know, we may go home and be crushed because of that. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. You had you, Lucy. You were saying comments. I'm I'm not looking. on Facebook, so I can't see them. No, there's just um, it's a really excellent discussion. It's so wonderful to see so many people joining in, and you know, yeah, it's it's just great. It's really great. Um, a lot of people are commenting that some of them are doing uh, check-ins and, and uh, discuss their boundaries before shows or before rehearsals, which is, which is really great. Because one thing that, again, so this is something from Adam and, and Lizzie, um, boundaries are not just flexible. They could be relative to context of what's happening with me. They could be relative to the person I'm right here and now in, in the moment. And uh, I might be okay with 
everybody else doing anything, but with this specific person, I suddenly have boundaries. And I, I love physical exercises where we actually um, do something like touching, touching your face. May, may, may I put my hand on, on your shoulder? May I do this? May I do that? And some people discover that they have those boundaries only when they actually do those physical checks. Uh, some people have no boundaries until you say, may I tickle you? And 99% and of, of people go, no, because tickling is not fun. Um, and also like an example that I had a very innocent offer and person said, yes, you can do that. I'm fine with it. And my offer was, may I hug you from behind? And it's actually, it's a very comforting position usually, but for that person that after I, I, I've done that, they went, oh, oh, no, actually, you know what, may I turn because that's, I, I don't see you, so I'm suddenly uncomfortable. So some of those boundaries may only be discovered after you've tried. Um, but that brings us to, again, to the comments that we are having. How often do these checks need, need to be done? Or how, because again, discussing boundaries in a group of three people may be fairly fairly quick in a duo, certainly. But if you have a company of 10, 12, 15 people, if it's a large class, how do we do it in a fast and efficient way that also feels like we are actually listening to those boundaries? Uh, my opinion on this is that I think, um, I think it's really important again to look at context and exactly what you said about spe specificity arena like in the uh, acronym but which isn't uh, an intimacy specific acronym but for consent uh fries f-r-i-e-s the s stands for specific meaning mm -hmm. that because you gave your permission uh, your consent sorry in in one instance uh, it might be different so if you if if i uh, consented to imogen holding my hand uh, in, in one scene uh, or in one show, it, it might be different next time. It's not, it doesn't give her free reign to do that every single time, right? So this only makes it even more complicated. But um, I guess what I'm saying is, I think there should be a, a real container or a, a bit of tape, red tape around, I hate bringing red tape into it, but around using intimacy in jam scenarios. Um, mm -hmm. And I think somebody else, I can't remember who came up with this, but they, I was, oh, it was, it was Jessica Steinrock, who's uh, an, an improviser and uh, an intimacy director with IDC, Intimacy Directors, uh, something, I can't remember, IDC anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. And she was saying about kind of having uh, a sort of scale of, and I can't remember the specific wording, but it was like professional boundaries, friendship boundaries, intimate boundaries and kind of having that as a label almost like a temperature chart for each event so it's it's my opinion that at a jam situation we don't want to be discovering on stage or in rehearsal for the first time that a boundary a boundary we have because the boundary was broken and mm -hmm. if you're working in a rehearsal situation for a scripted play it might be that we discover that and then there's a negotiation and a discussion that means that as we rehearse we gain information around this moment that we're staging but because improv just happens and is done i think there's a lot of room for things happening for the first time that aren't quite okay with everybody mm -hmm. so if you take out of it people who've just met for the first time people in a class people in a jam where i do think there should be tighter boundaries overall which are communicated ahead of time i.e this class there will be no kissing there will be no uh, there'll be no touching. I mean, hell, let's let's say that we're going to set it at business only. Like the only sort of touching would be the touching you'd have with a colleague at work, right? Immediately, that takes care of people. We can always change that as things go on and negotiate that. But it's a good placeholder, isn't it, to start with? 
Um, but then when you've got your team that you work with regularly on a regular basis, then I think a check in has to happen minimum every beginning of every session that you're you're having right and uh, there needs to be very frank conversations that go on about what your boundaries are some firm boundaries you have that are never changing perhaps um but also where how they how they change from person to person who you work with and i i don't think i'm not claiming this is a quick process at all i think that um you might need to do a different body map with every different person in your uh team but it's not wasted time and it will only go to fortify the trust and make better work. Mm. I, I couldn't agree more on the like um, staggered approach with beginners and jams having very clear guidelines and containers put in. And um, something that I have found uh, invaluable for more advanced groups and, um, and, a, and a company is creating that culture of open dialogue because as we've all, we've all said, we all make mistakes, we all overstep some things, we all learn a new boundary we have. And we've been using a lot of physical examples tonight, which I think is one of the easiest ways to help people understand boundaries. And what um, identifying our physical boundaries helps us do is, is they're tangible examples to start to explore our emotional boundaries. Like um, Jeremy said at the start, intimacy is not just physical it's also emotional and it's also um, subject area and content area that might override someone's boundary without um, without them knowing and um, what for me what I found helpful as a director for creating that culture of open dialogue is acknowledging at the start of the course you know um, we all have boundaries we all have subconscious bias we all have um, uh, improv as an art form where we're, we're saying things on the spot we're doing things on the spot, which means our subconscious bias can come out. Um, if this does happen, let's stop and let's talk about it. Let's have an open dialogue about it. And also model and encourage um, a feedback loop for the students, where if they have the students or the participants, if they have an experience in a scene um, or a game where they think they've over overrode someone's boundaries or their boundaries have been overridden, to have that chat and then um, practice like not like um I was about to say not being defensive practice uh trying to be open and curious about that conversation mm -hmm. it's like it's like to make it to practice not making it awkward being like oh hey Jeremy I held hands with you in that scene and I realized I didn't make eye contact with you how was that for you and Jeremy can be like oh that was fine I loved holding hands or Jeremy can be empowered to say actually Imogen that wasn't okay for me uh and I and for me to be like thank you for telling me thank mm. you and that's that's one of those wonderful exercises um that lucy taught me of practicing saying thank you when you receive a no and saying thank you when you receive a boundary and if you can help your company mod like by modeling that if you can help your classes model that then that's you're building the tools because as instructors and directors we can't catch everything when mm. we're human we're not going to notice every time something happens but if we can give the tools to all our participants so that they can be like oh something just happened there and I'm going to talk to this person about it or something just happened there and I'm going to talk to the instructor about it so I, I can find the language to do to figure out what's happened um I just think that's incredible and incredibly empowering like we already know all the wonderful things improv gives people for their life, but how empowering to have language around consent and boundaries and yeah. practice saying thank you when someone says it expresses a boundary. I'm like, yay, another thing improv can help me with my life for. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. It's yeah. exciting. It's exciting. It's ego yeah. work, isn't it? That's the thing is like, you know, the amount of times I keep getting it wrong and the amount of times people aren't, uh, you know, are in in things I'm doing, in work I'm doing, and it doesn't quite go right. It's uh, people's boundaries get pushed, or um, people are uncomfortable. Like it, it is hard to not take that on and feel absolutely terrible, or really take it in and internalize it. But it's it's so important, as you say, to be grateful for that extra knowledge and that it's all just a work in progress. And um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I keep thinking of things and then forgetting. I love that. I love that you said that it's ego work because it's um, it's so 
lovely when people are willing to say, when they're willing to communicate, they feel safe enough to say, that was not okay for me. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, saying thank you, which uh, I took a workshop with Lucy. I think I'm gesturing to you, Lucy, uh, <laughs> recently. And she, she was like, just say thank you. It's enough to say thank you. And I feel like that's um, something that we can apply not just to intimacy conversations, but anytime someone shares something mm -hmm. that uh, uh, that hasn't that involves you, to just be able to say thank you, thank you for sharing that with me. Yeah, and to mean yeah. it. And yeah, like um, when I was training in in the intimacy stuff, and we a lot of the stuff obviously we were doing was very intimate because of, of what we were doing, but. Um, there was a moment where I found myself quite triggered by something we were doing and um, and took myself out of the session and my instructors both came out and the first thing they said and I was waiting for them to be like are you all right are you okay do you need to take some time to look after yourself I'm sorry you're feeling like this and they just came out they were beaming and they were thank you thank you for stepping out and I was like <laughs> And it's, you know, when normally when you're fragile, when you're feeling a bit vulnerable and someone speaks to you and you want to cry, it makes you sort of cry because they're being nice to you. It, I just had the opposite feeling of that. I felt completely grounded and empowered and really calm. And uh, then they were like, how can we work with you to help you uh, communicate your boundaries and stay in the room? Now, I'm not putting a judgment on whether you leave the room, like obviously leave the room if you need to leave the room. But like, um, I felt so good because I felt like my boundaries uh, went like bloop, 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 like up a bit because I felt like next time if I were to experience the same sensation of flight I actually could probably do it in the room and that proved to be true because the situation I was working with um, occurred in such a way that I was able to then communicate in the room what I needed rather than leave mm. yeah mm. what cool. were you thinking Imogen, you, oh, you're just miming. I didn't know whether you'd got mute or anything. I just loved it. I just love it. <laughs> it is, it's so helpful because, um, you know, I, I do, I experience anxiety and, and a lot, quite a few things trigger me like loud noises and being grabbed places and it can feel so awkward and embarrassing to like suddenly ha be having an anxiety attack or like be welling up or feeling nervous. And in the companies where I have that trust and we have these conversations, it's so liberating. And I've done choices and done things that I never thought I'd like be able to do because I know if something oversteps, we've got those strategies in place to talk about those things. And like Lucy says, the strategies for the performer who is triggered by whatever to be like, oh, I've been triggered. I noticed that and I'm just gonna say in the moment, ah, oh, this isn't okay or change this situation. And I just think that's so liberating and beautiful. And you know, you were saying, Arena, at the start, how do we make, how do we make boundaries cool? Which I know I'm, I'm paraphrasing what you said, like, how do we make it like, <laughs> but like, it's liberating. It's, yeah. Boundaries are cool. They're so cool. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to make them cool. They are cool. Yeah. And I feel like um, we have a Sunday workshop uh, well, before coronavirus, <laughs> we had a Sunday workshop that had, we'd only missed one workshop in years. And we started at the beginning just saying uh, the different things that we do and don't do in the class. And one of those things was about physical boundaries. Um, and I think that's one step towards And also like, we would have all different levels coming to the class. So then it's it's saying, okay, even if you know someone really well in this situation, in this, in this workshop, none of us are doing that. Uh, and so the, the more experienced players get to model that behavior for the less experienced players coming to that workshop. And that's lovely. And that's a really small example of, of what we're talking about, I think. Well, I hear two things, no, three things, because boundaries are cool, yay, um, but, but two things that we keep saying is the more we do this work, the more we uh, practice um, setting our boundaries as 
part of a routine, um, the less awkward this will be. The, yeah, the, these are, this is the list. This is my kitchen list of, of where my boundaries are. And well, yeah, I will add something uh, just for tonight, um, which is great because the more we do that, uh, the faster it will be and the easier it will be. It will be just part of a normal check-in. We greet each other and then set our boundaries for the show. Great. But also, um, we say that uh, th just thinking about our boundaries lead to more self-awareness. Mm -hmm. So like, if I, if I say that I have no boundaries, do I really know myself that well? How, how would you react to that? How would you describe that? Hmm. I mean, in the context of the conversation we've already been having, it seems to me someone who is aware of their boundaries probably wouldn't say I have no boundaries. They would say, I'm very open in these ways and be able to say the, the sort of, not I have no boundaries, but my boundaries are here rather than mm. uh, whatever other boundaries, more mm, uh, explicit mm -hmm. boundaries other people might say. Mm -hmm. But that's, I'm sure that, carry on ladies, say things. Thinking of things that sort of loop back. So I'm doing, a, if, I, if I go back to them, I feel like I'm doing a bit of a yes, but, but <laughs> <laughs> still things that I think tie yeah. in, but they're only coming out kind of now. But I guess one thing is when we were talking about power dynamics, I wanted to say about the real power of, because I really, I'm hoping it's something we can maybe start to instigate in the improv community. Um, the real power of having third, a third party in the room. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm really keen. I've not managed to make it happen yet, either virtually or in real life given the circumstances, but um, in the training that I did, and this is all kind of my experience of having done a workshop where they modeled this behavior, right? Was my instructors aware of the power dynamics that would be going on where all of us learning from them and wanting to be as successful as they are in the world of intimacy, they found uh, somebody who had an interest in uh, the arts and advocacy and safety. She's wonderful. I don't want to down, downplay her, Rachel Vogler, but um, they, they had her just in, the, and again, it downplays it, but she was just present doing very, not doing very little. I'm sure she's working really hard as in she does work for them. But what I mean is she had a presence in the room that was not the same presence. It was a different presence to the instructors in the room, right? And it was so handy because when there was a chance for feedback, we could speak to her as another conduit for our thoughts, mm -hmm. but she was present in the room to witness anything. So if there was something that had happened, it's just so empowering to have another person in the room who isn't, nothing hinged on her. She wasn't gonna mark us in our work we were doing. She wasn't giving us feedback. She isn't a professional in the intimacy uh, arena. And that was so handy. Now, I don't know how we make that happen in improv, but I do know that I would love to have the resources to make that happen the next time I direct something. Um, mm. And I, I don't know, I don't know whether there's a sort of round robin thing we can do where we help each other out in our communities um, and that uh, I, I sit in on a project that I'm not invested in uh, and, and vice versa, but I think that was very powerful. I love that word, the advocate, just like the room advocate. He's yeah. just there like, hey, <laughs> I'm here if you need me. Gorgeous. Never felt an energy like that in the room before. I've never been in a room where that was a thing. How do you see it working in improv, Lucy, in terms of, uh, let's say that we have a foundations class and there's, um, there's a, a room advocate in the room. Uh, how do you explain their role and what does that look like? Well, um, I, would, I would say that you just make a very clearly defined statement around the fact that that person, I, I think ideally it's someone who isn't in the improv community. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we manage that, but uh, and probably it means having to pay an extra person, but 
you know, I do think if we want to be really serious about this work, sometimes it's worth paying somebody to do that, you know, but uh, I, I think I think you just explain to people, this person's sitting in, they're not here to observe, they're not here to mark, they're not even an improviser. Um, they're here because I encourage you to reach out to them if you'd like to speak about anything that's happened that you don't want to speak to me about. Um, I, yeah, like they're, they're here for you to talk to and have another presence in the room. Um, mm. I, and, and I would say to my students anyway, like I encourage you to call me out if you want to, like mm. if, if, you, if that happens. Uh, and I just think it does, a, it does something to just take some of the power that you naturally hold as a person running a class and just take it out a little bit. And I think this is partly done in some of the excellent codes of conduct and kind of complaints uh, procedures that a lot of improv schools and theatres have now, which means that you have got an, an array of people to whom you could take a complaint. But I think that's very different to having had a person in the room perhaps witness that moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. But I don't know, it's not a fully formed idea I've got, but I think it's just nice. Yeah, I guess we just, we need to try and see how, how that works um, or doesn't work because yeah changing power dynamic and having a sort of insurance um is is invaluable for the performers themselves but we have a question here um in the chat that i think is really interesting although it takes us in a slightly different direction but it's it's still about communicating what you mean or why you do what you do so um, if, if the performers are, are trained in different styles or in different uh, schools, so let's say somebody is trained uh, with Meissner and they know that saying no is yeah, just an offer that could be taken uh, in, a, in any direction and they feel safe saying no or establishing boundaries or or walking off stage with other performers trained in the same tradition. But it somehow gets more complicated when they play with people who, who don't have the same understanding, who have come from different um, improv schools or have different training. Um, how would that play? Or how, how would you suggest uh, go around in this situation? No, it's got to come from the top, right? Yeah, that was my gut. Was it's all it's on the facilitator, instructor, director. I feel to establish a consensual framework, and I imagine I feel like some of you have more experience of European festivals than I do. I went I went to a few in Australia and maybe one over here, but you do get that situation a lot where you get lots of different styles. Um, I just realized I said European festivals and then I saw Australia. I don't think Australia is <laughs> um, uh, But you get this wonderful mix of people of different styles and different backgrounds playing together. And one strategy you can take is that kind of um, uh, jam contract that Lucy kind of reference of like, this is a jam or this is a mix of players. These are the ground rules we're going to establish. No physical contact, no kissing, you know, and you can make it fun. It doesn't have to be like, these are the rules. It's like, these are the, uh, the, the, the little containers we're putting in tonight so we all have a good time. Um, but the other thing you can do if you are in a rehearsal is you've got time to make a group contract. Right, that can take 15 minutes, 20 minutes of your session. Be like, hey, we're, we, we're all different backgrounds, um, different styles. What is what are the, some of our expectations of our group? Right? What do we uh, what do we want to what, what what's our contract in this room? I think yeah. So it's it's always I feel like it's nearly always the instructor director modeling that. In fact, one question I would have for the group, I've got a question if I'm allowed, <laughs> is when you're a participant in a room that's not being facilitated in this way and your alarm bells are grow going, you're like, oh, we're about to be put on stage or we're about to, uh, I've got, just got those little alarm bells going. What, what strategies can we do as a participant in the room? Speak up. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I've noticed this. I'd like to take a poll or I'd like to 
have this conversation, even if we do it very quickly, because we only have five minutes, can we just go around and say, as Lisa said, three things that are okay that we can do together or find a way to communicate and take responsibility for that. I feel if you see something, say something. <laughs> and it's scary and you have to be very brave to do it. And, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm bringing my, my best self and I feel like I've learned a lot and I feel really strong to have those views now. And I don't think I would have done a year ago. Um, and even then to be the person in the room who says, can we do, I mean, I think, <laughs> can we do a body map and say what's okay? And it's like, oh, maybe that's not the way to do it, to broach it to a room who aren't expecting it. But like, uh, yeah, it's still really scary to, to be the person to say that. But I think you just have to go double down on it really think and, and we'll for change. the i i agree with what imogen said about about uh, the facilitator needs to take the lead for working with lots of different players but if you're someone trained in miser and you know that okay i want to say no and i want to push those boundaries a bit you you can if you if you feel brave enough and the facil facilitator isn't having that conversation you can say hey uh, I've worked in Meisner. Has anybody else here worked in Meisner? I'd like to try this if if it comes up. Mm -hmm. um, and you can speak up on behalf of yourself if that's of interest to you. And like Lucy says, and uh, I know it's true for myself, uh, <laughs> it, I, it can be scary. Yeah. But just looking in the comments, not? Scott said something brilliant, which is there is such a there is such a thing as supportive confrontation. <gasps> Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But but it all comes to I think to the very first thing that we said, um, that we need a shared vocabulary. We need a shared understanding. We need if we see something, sometimes it's just a feeling and you you don't know how to speak up because it's just a feeling of uncomfortableness you don't know how to describe what you're witnessing but if you learn if you work on on this you suddenly have that that information and the, the exact term the exact label to put on the on the thing uh, that you're witnessing but that brings me to another question that we had in the comments um which is um imagine now i feel like i say yes but uh, because you suggested that this is the responsibility of the, the director or the facilitator. One of the questions that we received, um, what if the facilitator or the director struggles with being heard or not being heard, um, perhaps when teaching um, an unruly younger class of boys? Uh, and it's not it's not just for Imogen. How how do we how do we manage that? Well, I hope that I don't end up teaching an unruly class of boys again. I mean, I have done that in the past. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no, no, actually, I'm sure I probably will. And actually, it would be as relevant for them to learn about consent as it would for anybody else, wouldn't it? But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, how do you how do you empower yourself? I tend to just work with people who want to do the sort of work that I want to do. But maybe that's not. Mm. Yeah, sometimes it is a hard sell. Mm -hmm. But I think you know in your conscience kind of what has to happen sometimes. And if that means calling something out or stopping something or navigating options for people to step aside or step out or having to hold someone back and chat to them after. It's all of these things that are a bit icky and messy and potentially tricky and but I think it's important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm still learning how to do it, frankly. Um, I've been, so I have uh, massive uh, people pleaser tendencies. Me too. I've also, since um, a child, been a big believer in justice, um, thanks to the modeling of my mother, who I love very much. Um, so I've always tried to speak up, like Jeremy said, speak up and challenge things when I thought they were unjust. Um, and so recently to help me override my people pleaser tendencies, I've developed a little traffic light system uh, for handling what I call handling sensitive issues. So this is, um, I've done it for my difficult, I do, do a course called being a difficult woman. 
about owning being difficult and and, and it, it connects to this question um, that was in the chat because uh, in my experience I've encountered that situation when as a young um, female teacher coming through uh, I would often have male members of my class tell me how like they'd start teaching the improv and I'd have to like navigate how to like be like okay let's just readdress this power dynamic in a way that wasn't the, uh, and I've learned strategies for that over the years but um one yeah one useful tool for me recently has been this traffic light system of um how serious is the offense or the situation and uh, for me developing different scripts or strategies to go along with each thing. Okay, so if, if someone um, overrides a boundary, they they hug someone and that person's uncomfortable, and then immediately they're like, "Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I overrode your boundary." Um, that was, and they're really open about it. Okay, that's like a green situation, and you're like, "Oh, well done, so and so, for um, recognizing that you overrode so and so's boundary." That's you know here, and you can use it as a chance to teach the lesson of boundaries again to the class. Whoopsie, yay, yay, we've learned something. If um, so and so keeps hugging people uh, and doesn't acknowledge that it's um, making some people uncomfortable, that might be accelerate to an orange situation. Okay, this is orange. Um, you've got strategies there as part of the class. You could use it as a learning opportunity. Oh, um, so and so, you've uh, you've hugged three people in scenes uh, in the past three scenes. Uh, let's be mindful that everyone has different boundaries. Uh, and how are you doing? Did you, you know, I mean, not always putting it on the student to explain, but using it as a chance to address that, or you could speak to them one-to-one, -one, like Lucy suggested, like uh, in that situation. And then there's, for me, there's the red category, which is um, the kind of situation where uh, the hugger has been warned. They, you've done that little chat with them privately or with the class about boundaries. Uh, and then they've gone and they've done it again. I'm using hugging because it's quite a sort of easy example, but I hope you can all imagine the different kind of, this could be racist, sexist, homophobic situations. It could be um, uh, other things that come up that override boundaries, emotional, physical language. Um, our hugger goes and they, they hug and they squeeze from behind someone who's really uncomfortable with that. And then it's time, I, I believe it's really important to really um, step up as as um, facilitators and directors and you know different strategies like teacher voice please don't do that no not even please but I'm feeling embarrassed trying to do teacher voice on this call I understand but, uh, that is not allowed in this room you've been warned of this before <laughs> please leave this leave this theatre space and I'll talk to you after the class right I um and I do teach kids so uh, I do have that teacher voice that I can go into um and I just I just believe that's really important. And what has helped me with the traffic lights is because this is so nebulous and it's so um, hard to pin down, for me as a people pleaser, I loved having a script and context to follow. So I've got my little traffic lights and I'm like, oh, I'm up to this level now. Rather than younger, more awkward Imogen would be like, oh, should I tell them off? Because I don't know, <laughs> maybe they'll like make everyone feel uncomfortable. Um, but what I came to is my little mantra is making a person with privilege feel uncomfortable is worth it to challenge oppression um, against the less privileged. And then I changed that to making someone who's overriding someone's boundaries uncomfortable is worth it to protect the person whose boundaries are being overridden. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're soaking up a bit of that uncomfortability mm -hmm. so that the people who are paying money to be here in our space are safer, right? And and that's why our own self-care is really important as professionals doing this work. Um, uh, you know, I recently did one of my assessments for my training and I had to do a to-do list for my intimacy thing. And uh, my tutor said, and where's your self-care on this to-do list? Because mm -hmm. you're going to need some self-care having conducted this work, right? And, and it's so true, isn't it? Is that we need to soak up some of that stuff and take that on in the room. And that's stressful. And we're doing that so that we create safer places to work. Um, so yeah, everyone remember your own self-care as well. I taught high school students for six years and I found that kids really love boundaries. Not, not in a, you know, boundaries doesn't mean, um, 
you know, I love that you said teacher voice because uh, teacher face and teacher voice when when needed is really useful. Um, and it doesn't have to be a long talking to. It can just be as simple as that's not acceptable or we don't do that here. And, and just drawing a very firm boundary very quickly and then moving on. And um, I haven't taught improv to kids in a very long time. And the kids that I have taught it to were kids who were interested. So I don't feel like I can speak to um, teaching improv to kids, to children. So I will leave, uh, uh, you're the expert in that. Imogen's above me on my screen. You're the expert in that, Imogen. I don't know if I call myself an expert. My kids are very keen as well. Um, yeah, I, I teach at a very um, privileged girls' school and they're sweet as buttons, most of them. So I feel like the unruly boys is something I'm yet to experience. Yeah. But, but the more I teach kids, the more I think I start to teach adults the way I teach kids. I believe it all crosses over. And... Mm. Um, the strategies I've, I've used for unruly men, as I almost started talking about these men who like try to mansplain improv to me while I was teaching them, was just to use some status stuff I'd learned and just to, to bring in my status mm -hmm. again. And mm -hmm. like you said, it doesn't have to be, it can just be really clear that's not acceptable here. Or if they're just interrupting to mansplain, I'd be like, thanks for your point. We're moving on to this now. <laughs> thanks for sharing. Uh, based on the time I spent training in uh, training for 10 years in this art form, this is what I think. And we're going to move on to this thing now. <laughs> and I just really politely, but clearly move the thing on to what it's meant to be. Um, I think I've sometimes just said, thank you. I've got this. <laughs> that's exactly that's I what think, i say i love i don't it. even say thank you i'm just like i've got it <laughs> that, i'm gonna write that one down i've been making some notes what is <laughs> i'm gonna take that one i've got this i've got this <laughs> yeah so, uh, it's interesting how, how we're talking about kids but sometimes adults can be just as intolerable especially if they're they think that they have more power Mm, then you I'm looking to um, to more comments and I love because it, it relates to uh, to the importance of the facilitators role um, one of the comments is we must advocate for our students and not expect them to advocate for themselves so it's it's, it's great if somebody is equipped and has the knowledge and the the courage to speak up, but it's always on the facilitator to establish those clear boundaries and to um, take care of, of the people they are teaching or they and I think, And I think it does come back to the context thing again of whether you, mm -hmm. I do, I wanna make this distinction of whether you're teaching or whether you're directing, mm -hmm. because I do think that's slightly different in that, mm -hmm. yes, people who are coming to you for a, an experience of learning improv, um, perhaps, who are going to have one interaction with it a week and kind of, you know, I think, yes, we do have to advocate for people uh, and not necessarily expect them to have it all. Um, I do think when we're working with professionals, we're working in directing a piece of work, a piece of theatre, a piece of improv, um, there is a point where we can only go so far. I think one of the things I was taught in, in my intimacy direction is that we're not there as a counsellor, we're not there as a mental health expert you know we've done our mental health first aid training maybe but we're there to deal with the situation and within the role of, of intimacy director and we we can't take that I don't know we can't go too far with that we've got to stay in our lane of what we're there to do and that means advocating for that person offering uh, resources for that person and to help get them to a point where they're able to communicate those boundaries and we can work out how to make the work and, and as well, when you're in a scripted piece as well, you're working as an intimacy director alongside a director, right? So you're trying to also bring that, equate the, the boundaries of the person, the actor you're working with, with the director's vision of what the piece is, right? And finding a route that works for both to create the thing that they, that the director wanted whilst not going through any of the boundaries of the performer who's going to bring it to life, right? Uh, so yeah, I, I think it does, there is a thing about giving, 
in a professional context, that person, the skills and resources they need to then fly and take that stuff themselves. And I do think that, and that's going to be the thing that changes our industry. It's just going to be the thing that changes it. Having gone into a theatre school recently and teaching this to their undergraduates, um, I feel very confident that there are a whole generation of young people going out now who know what their rights are around uh, again the scripted work they know what their rights are around nudity clauses and auditions and being asked to do a thing last minute at, at an audition and I think they feel confident enough to say actually that's not in the rules I don't you, I do not have to uh, do nudity in this audition without notice you mm -hmm. know uh, and yeah I think I think that's really good and that people are starting to see the value that actually, well, maybe you don't want to work with that person if that's what they're expecting from you. Find someone else to work with. Mm. That job. Yeah, it all comes back to the old Keith Johnston's maxim, don't work with assholes. Um, <laughs> uh, right, but th this, this also, um, it's, it was a question in the comments, but I'd like to, to make it a little bit broader. So the question was, what are the best ways to explain to someone who doesn't feel or understand anxiety, the importance of boundaries? So they, they understand that, the, that no means no, but don't understand why. And to me, that sounds like, why do you need to explain why? Um, so when I hear you talk about students that already know their rights and, and know that, yeah, they have the right to, 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 to set their boundaries, to state out loud that they're not going to do this, but they will clash at some point with somebody who still expects that because we are still in that transition period where not everybody is on the same page. And I think it's a, um, a lot trickier in improv because of our culture of yes ending, right? So if, if we yes everything, but then this thing is allowed to be or is required to, to have no's in it, um, then it, it suddenly, screws everybody's brain and, and what. Um, so when people state that there is something that, that, that is a no for them, there is a boundary, there is um, a job required of them that they're not gonna do for whatever reason, do they need to really say why? No, right? Um, then how do we communicate that to the people who, who would still question that, who are, are raised or trained in the old ways when they, they are expecting you to say yes? I think I would drop in my phrase, it's not my phrase, a phrase that I learned um, in my training, which is flow through the no, um, in that we don't need to dwell on why or in fact sometimes we yeah like it, we don't it works both ways the person has the right to not tell you give reasons why but also maybe we don't want to know why actually <laughs> like maybe that's going to impringe on our boundaries to find out why but I think yeah in the scenario you're describing where there's an individual in the room who despite being told the boundaries of another person is questioning those boundaries. Well, why couldn't you? Well, surely you haven't got a problem with, why can't you just? I think the whole point here is that we are, firstly, I would not be very happy to work with that person um, at all, but I, and, and I, I wouldn't feel any great need to educate them because the tone would feel very just combative, I think. But I think I'd be saying, well, we are creatives. We can find a range of fantastic creative solutions to achieve the same goal without this thing like that's what we are like if, if 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 we need to do if we need to do a love scene an entire love scene with my zero touch it is absolutely 100 percent possible and a fantastic creative decision that might look wonderful and look much better than a badly improvised kiss like it's gonna only it's possibly gonna heighten the work out you know take it out of the room it's gonna be so amazing 
um, yeah, like there's loads of other creative possibilities, the creative possibility of self touch, right, that we haven't even talked about, um, which also very interestingly to me needs consent, you know, how does, how does the other person feel making eye contact with you while you self touch, like, how does that change things? Um, but, but yeah, there's creative solutions, we don't need to dwell on the no, we just need to blow through the no onto the next way of solving the thing that we're doing to make it brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Lucy, you had some language that you used um, in the last workshop I took with you about flowing through the no, which was negotiating. Uh, negotiating. Yes. Um, could you speak a little bit about how that can work in terms of if, if I if I ask you, Lucy, uh, may I touch your cheek? Mm. Then if that's a no for me, I've got a few different options. Well, I've got a few different options. I could say, yes, absolutely. Great. No problem. Um, I, I could also ask a question and say, um, yeah, can I think I'm OK with that. Can you clarify how long you're going to be touching my cheek for or what level of pressure you're going to be touching my cheek with? Um, there's so many variables around that, right? which is why it's so difficult in improv, because we can't pause in an improv show and negotiate how long or what level of pressure there's going to be. Um, Can I just interject? I would quite like to see that scene, though. <laughs> I would yes. really enjoy. How, <laughs> sorry, how long are you going to hold my cheek for? And what pressure? <laughs> oh, for two seconds. And with high pressure. Mm, no, 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 I just... I would 25 seconds with very light pressure. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see that scene. Yeah. 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 And maybe that would be a thing to bring on stage. Maybe it's good in performance. Yeah. Consent the show. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I remember you saying uh you could suggest another option. I'm not okay with you touching yes. my cheek, but if you'd like to put your hand on my shoulder, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so so you can go for a yes, you can go for a yes with a clarification, you can go with a no. Um, but you can also to take away this this as a as a sort of technique to take away this feeling of if I say no, it's gonna be a real deflator of the vibe, the the energy, the yes room that we've got going on. We can uh these are wonderful words again that I completely uh credit to Lizzie Tolbert uh, and Yarrett Dorr from uh, Intimacy for Stage and Screen, but you can pivot. So uh, you can say, um, a hand, hand on the cheek's not gonna work for me, but how about you um, put your hand on the back of my neck and then bring it down onto my shoulder, which is again a negotiation because we need to check that the other person's okay with the hand on the back of, putting their hand on the back of your neck for whatever reason. But you, you can suggest uh, something of equal value how else can we tell this story using different vocabulary, which is endless. And that's where the creative part of it comes in, that it's not mm. all just boundaries and red tape and saying no. It's, it's, it's where improv beautifully Venn diagrams of intimacy direction of uh, adjustments and counter offers and um, pivoting, pivoting and adjusting. And I love that word adjustment. Can we make a little adjustment to that mood? because it is just it's minor isn't it and so it doesn't feel like you're saying stop everything I cannot have a hand on my cheek it's um yeah it's a it's a counter offer mm. yeah yeah and I'm I'm excited about equipping our uh, improvisers with the language to do that mid-scene so that they can do it after scene and before scene but in the same way you know that you uh, I remember teaching students that if they laugh in a scene to own that as part of the story like mm. I, I I was you know I, I made that funny that idea of that but I would I honestly would love to see these negotiations on stage and just honored as part of the story and this is just yeah. a partnership who are like no you can't touch my cheek but you can erotically touch this table do you know what I mean I feel like I learned something from Paddy Stars um once she she uh I don't know if she was explicitly talking to us about intimacy, but she had this instruction to be like, oh, if you're not sure about where your partner's at, you can, and it's becoming a sexual intimate scene, you can say something like, assume the position, right? And that gives your partner all the position, all the, all the empowerment to do what they want. And the position could be like holding a tennis racket and a ball and like the way this 
couple is intimate is by like playing tennis together in a really like sexual way and I'm like that's yeah intimacy intimacy doesn't necessarily mean getting all smoochy and all over each other intimacy can be playing erotic tennis Imogen Palmer 2020 <laughs> <laughs> Joe, Joe Bill had a fun technique, to, well, uh, just a useful technique, which is if you are going to touch someone in a scene, make it a really big slow motion so they have time to move out of the way if they're, if they're not interested in that, which I thought he, he called it flagging. Um, and I think that's something really useful too, that we can incorporate this idea of, I'm asking for permission by if if we haven't had time to have the conversation or if it's one of those um yeah whatever just give your partner the opportunity to to not receive that that touch if they don't want it absolutely and and to speak to that even even more Jeremy like um the the discipline and sort of learning how to because I found this quite hard in terms of impulse control if you are offering somebody uh, a handshake for example or a hug so if I was saying in real life uh Imogen uh shall we have a hug mm. it, it even if Imogen says yes I could still stand there and wait for Imogen to come to me rather than because it all kind of can happen very quickly otherwise which kind of says it goes with what you're saying about slowing down um, equally the handshake I can hold the handshake out I don't have to grab Imogen's hand and and shake it I can wait and Imogen can grab my hand and then we can shake so the idea of just that self-restraint and checking yourself is a really good discipline I think to learn as an improviser and if the shake or the hug isn't um, uh, reciprocated what a scene offer oh my mm -hmm. gosh like yeah totally I don't, we're not hugging anymore, you know. <laughs> I think we're in a really fun chance to practice this in, in two meter distanced improv as well. It's another one of those, uh, so there's a silver lining of, of this pandemic is the chance to see, yeah, how can we communicate love at a distance? How can we create interest? I think it's gonna be an absolute game changer, isn't it? Because we've just mm -hmm. taken, as sad as it is, it's just gone with everybody. And in that horrible void is actually a whole load of learning and a whole load of safety that when we come back, it's going to be tentative, but it's going to be beautiful and hopefully really consensual. <laughs> I mean, what a world. It's going to be great. Yeah. Yes. Um, this is in, in a very interesting way leads us to one of the questions in, in the chat. Um, is there a guide on how to show affection or intimacy between two characters with minimum physical contact? And I think we've already thrown in a few ideas with tennis and, and everything, but if there is a guide, I can know. I don't think it, 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 it should even be um, like a step, um, regimented yeah I, I, I would yeah. recommend I mean there, there maybe there is a uh, maybe there is a guide maybe we'll write a guide but <laughs> but I would say I think somebody else said this don't underestimate eye contact as a mm. thing I think some of the stuff around that I was talking about around self-touch is very interesting you know the uh, there's a lot of stuff around the psychology of kind of if you're if you're caressing uh you know your collarbone or something like that is a very sensual thing to do um that you know that is really interesting but i would also recommend again from my learning uh we've done a lot of work around kind of classical art and classical statues so um looking at, and this is far more kind of movement direction stuff but looking around um sort of uh crossed and uncrossed and spirals and um things being kind of I just look like I'm just flirting I'm loving it I'm like yes Lucy this is beautiful. I'm <laughs> you look at classical, classical statues and you look at the difference between something being completely uh, symmetrical and stuff being asymmetrical can can really yeah you could just do a whole scene where there's no touch but you play with responding to somebody else's physical offer around symmetry and asymmetry and I yeah. think 
energy can be beautiful as well again jeremy mentioned this at the start energy mm -hmm. and still being mindful that that energy could cross someone's boundary but i i remember doing an exercise with nadine antler who's based she based in Würzburg, i think in, in germany um but i met her in australia um but she had one where we were playing with like erotic energy um and like communicating that at the distance and like and we in that exercise we did walk up to someone and we the, the the words we used were go you just whispered go in that ear and then mm. they could walk to someone else but the idea was to practice giving those like using your erotic energy and your come to bedness <laughs> with with someone using your eyes and just and slowing down that walk rather than anything anything other than that and i found that really useful as a as a way of yeah communicating in not just erotic energy but of a romantic how, how can you communicate romantic energy from distance how can you play a villain uh from a distance and create like uh it's that one i always give uh you know we've always had like, overexcited students who are just too ready to do stage combat on stage and you're like improvised stage combat is a whole <laughs> thing that we're not doing here how can you be violent at a distance without moving Oh, what an acting challenge. Ooh, yum, 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 yum. <laughs> That's the, that is the same challenge as with um, intimacy. You know, there's huge parallels between intimacy and fight directing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's many, many intimacy directors who have come to intimacy direction through fight direction because they were being called to fight direct a show and then the director saying, oh, we've also got this other scene and them saying, well, this isn't fighting. This is something else, you know. Um, and but it is the same thing if you if we we don't do a punch on stage do we in improv <laughs> like we don't we do do kissing and I, I think we need to learn from the fact that we don't do one so it's interesting that we're doing the other and I'm not I mean I love I love improv shows with kissing <laughs> I love that but I do think we need to be when you look at the safety measures that go into place around a scripted kiss it's bamboozling that we do it without that. And, and this comes from somebody who loves doing that. I love shows with that in, but I, I can't go back to the way I was thinking before mm. where I would just freely kiss anyone, not least because now we have a terrible threat of um, transferable health conditions in terms of COVID as well. Like, yeah. I, I do want to say I, uh... I took a class with Keith Johnstone and he's notorious for making lists and lists and lists. And he gave us uh, a list of ways to flirt. And he has lists of all kinds of things. And he took this list from, it's based on Dr. Irenaeus Eibel Elpsfeldt's Instruction for the Universal Human Flirting Behavior from the Max Planck Institute in Munich. Amazing. Oh, it's so lovely. Yeah. That. Yeah, so he's um, he's he's got lists for all kinds of behaviors. Um, I don't know where you would find all of his lists, barring taking a class with him. Uh, I don't know if he's put them all in a book. Uh, I think Improv can... Storytellers has some lists in the back, mm -hmm. if I remember. Yeah, it's with characters and, uh, and situations, yes. but. Um, <laughs> It would be really interesting because if it's Max Planck Institute, it's probably for research. Now I want to know what kind of research they've done with those lists. Um, this is amazing. And we are already getting like from, from the safety uh, space or safe and open space uh, in our groups and schools to the actual intimacy and, and the actual creativity that is happening on stage. How do we? I don't. I don't want to say. Okay, just a simple question. How do we keep that safety when we are on stage in the moment, uh, and we want to do something risky? We go very slow, slow down. We negotiate. That's fine. Where do we go from there? I think there's a whole methodology that needs to be discovered that I was on the start of starting to discover when COVID hit. Um, and 
yeah I, I i think as as jeremy said about going slowly that's one thing we can do um i think this all has to take into account all that groundwork having happened already within your group um and and i think i guess so if you look at stuff around intimacy direction we tend to refer to the uh, the pillars of intimacy um one of which is context so again in a scripted piece saying well okay we've got this kiss that happens that's su supposed to happen um have they kissed before why are they kissing when are they kissing where are they who initiates the kiss does the kiss change like there's loads of context stuff around it um, and I think how we apply context to improv is kind of like having a discussion with your group around why do we think that intimacy might come up in the work we're doing? And obviously, I, I don't think we've necessarily laboured the point enough that intimacy doesn't necessarily have to be romance, right? That intimacy can happen. Childbirth is intimate. Um, caring for an elderly person is intimate. Um, caring, you know, having a child, all that kind of stuff. Um, but to talk to our group around okay uh, i'm in an, i'm personally in an improvised shakespeare group what sort of intimacy might occur in the context of that work um if you're doing uh, I, I i did some work with um katie and ed who do a katie shoot and ed farga who do a um rom-com improvised rom-com so like okay let's look at what are the sorts of moments that might come up of intimacy in this context so I guess it's having a really honest conversation with your group, whether that's a genre based group or not, about why do we think intimacy might come up and how can we justify that it should happen? Mm -hmm. I suppose what I'm getting at is like, if it's that you do a snog for a laugh to get an audience laugh, I don't think that's good context for doing the thing that doing that. Um, that's judgy of me, maybe, but I don't know. Uh, if we can't do it well, is it really worth doing? Can we just do something else? Like, so, so I think it's that. And then, and then it's starting to look at all of this great stuff that we just started talking about. And the Imogen was saying about wanting to, I think it is really interesting to see that negotiation of consent on stage. Mm -hmm. I think it could become part of the work. Um, and that might be looking at non, non verbal. Thank you for everybody who's doing all the references to the pillars in the chat, by the way. Um, but like it might be doing references to uh, non verbal references to what you want to do uh, and working out codes of non verbal stuff. Um, I wonder whether, for example, if, if you're in a team where you've decided that a kiss is, an, is a thing that you want to include or have the openness to include, I wonder if it's um, the cupping of some of the person's face. Um, as an initiation point before you bring the face the, the faces together um which would give maybe a signal it's so hard doing with nobody here but if you're if you're cupping somebody's face and they choose to put their hand on top of yours maybe that's a signal that it's okay and they could then guide you in uh or they could <laughs> do that maybe but that's kind of one thing I've thought of and I thought, well, maybe there's other ways of doing this. But there's so many infinite ways of portraying intimacy. So, I, yeah, I also just love the simple may I just ask you, mm. may I, sure. can I kiss you? Which is also something um, I, do, I do in real life with uh, with that sort of thing. Can I get, can I hug you? Because I'm a notorious hugger. Mm. That's the reason I used hugging earlier. I love hugging people. Not so much at the moment. Um, but uh i learned that not everybody likes hugging and one of my really close friends had a chat with me and was like i imagine i'm i don't like hugs and i had to have a com serious conversation with myself and be like oh not everyone likes hugs i'm gonna start asking people <laughs> and not just yeah. assume and yeah what a gift would you like a hug no oh thank you thank you <laughs> i love that i also um Lizzie, you had another great point about uh, we can use our very clever uh, staging to have someone downstage and another person upstage so that if you're going in for a kiss, this, maybe I'm not doing it right, can look like a kiss, mm. but they're not even actually touching. Yeah, there's a lot of good options for non-contact kisses that look 
possibly even better than a, a, an improvised spur of the moment kiss that's a bit uncertain. Um, and there's really good techniques that I'm absolutely not going to be able to convey over Zoom. But um, yeah, as you say, Jeremy, staging is, is part of it. But those, yeah, non-contact kisses are a really um, well-used option professionally because if, especially in musical theatre, for example, where um, actors don't want to be catching colds off each other and losing their voices when they're needing to sing, it's uh, one of the things we've learned is to always have a, a plan B. You know, someone gets a cold sore and you can't kiss. I'm talking about in a scripted show where they're doing it every night, you know, uh, suddenly someone's got braces or whatever, like, and can't kiss anymore. Like there needs to be other options. And uh, I, I don't see why in our improv world we couldn't learn those techniques um so yeah i guess i'm saying hire an intimacy director and uh yeah. have a session with an intimacy director one of, of your group one of my notes in this was i i can't remember which question it was arena but because you gave us the question in advance one of them was like what can companies do and i'm like hire lucy <laughs> Just, <laughs> please because <laughs> you need her uh, well, you, um, Lucy, I, th I feel like you will have a lot of job offers. In oh, the, in the <laughs> I hope but so. At the very lovely. least, people, please do take a workshop with Lucy. Mm, yeah. And, and I will put all the links in the chat um, as soon as I, I get my hands uh, on it. But, I, I, I've credited them already, but I have learned everything that I'm learning. I've, I'm applying it to improv, but I'm, I've learned it all from um, Intimacy for Stage and Screen. So I do want to credit them. They are fantastic, really fantastic. Yeah. yeah, they they are really um, great, and 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 they have a lot of workshops online, which is um, not only uh, them uh, IDC as well, but it's it's again it's it's a great opportunity right now that we have uh, where we both have access to all those resources when we need them, and we have the time because we cannot go back to our theaters and actually do stuff uh now we have the, the the opportunity to learn and to process what we do and why we do things um, um the way they they usually do um okay um i think we don't have new comments in the chat which brings me back to the list of questions that that i had um and there is one that is to me feels very important and i think it it appeared in the chat in 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 some way because uh some people may have trouble advocating for themselves or for the others so as a as a performer for themselves or as a facilitator as a director or as a teacher for the others if their identity um is not dominant in the room so can we talk for a moment about the intersection of gender race identity and how that affects our ability to advocate for ourselves and i would like to openly acknowledge that we are four white women um and we cannot speak for everybody and our experiences won't apply for everybody but this is a place to start this conversation at least. And again, if anybody has comments, questions, their own experiences without names, please do put them in the chat. Mm -hmm. I think that goes back to the having the power in the room um, that we started the conversation with, the, the status and the power and being aware again and these are lessons hard learned being aware of of uh, who's in the room and uh, what what are you representing who can identify with you um i'm not being clear i i'm just thinking i'm trying to put myself in the shoes of someone who might not uh look like me or have the same gender and are they going to feel comfortable saying to or they're not my age or whatever are they going to feel comfortable uh speaking up and saying hey i'm not okay with that or i feel uncomfortable in this group of mostly men or whatever it is 
Yeah, I, th I think um, I'm going to openly acknowledge as well, like this is quite a big question. We were, I think we're all probably getting uh, a bit tired and it's late, but like, uh, I, I think it's one of those things where we need to educate ourselves. We need to really, really go out and, and do the work that we can to educate ourselves, whether that's taking courses in inclusion, whether that's doing um, the anti-racist theatre courses, which I know there's some really good ones out there um, that I've signed up to. Um, it's speaking to people, it's broadening the circles that you're you're in. Um, it's, it's also sometimes stepping out of the way. So um, I know that there's a big, th a big problem in intimacy direction is there's so many white women doing it, basically. It's completely overrun. I've, I've, and I've only added to that problem. <laughs> Um, but uh, I've, I've sent some resources to, to Arena to post, but there's, you know, um, Intimacy Directors of Colour um, uh, Association who are, who are doing that work. I know Yarrett Daw, um is has just recently had uh, Arts Council funding to uh, run a mentorship scheme to increase diversity within the industry. Um, and yeah, I encourage if, if the deadline hasn't closed for that and, and uh you are somebody who is not white or or has other diverse uh, qualities um, to to go and sign up to that as well. Um, yeah, so I don't think it's anything I can particularly preach on other than I'm trying to do the work. I don't need to shout about the fact I'm doing the work, and uh, by which I mean trying to learn more. Uh, and when, if if I were to be asked to intimacy direct a show that was a story about people who weren't white. I would probably get the hell out of the way and let somebody else step up and take that job and not that not be me um basically <laughs> that's as far as i've got with it i don't know um and and of course with other stuff in terms of like gender um and, and sexuality and things like that as well we've done a whole lot of work around um inclusivity around that and uh, being aware that if we're talking about bodies and we're talking about body parts that language around that needs to be adapted and changed and um, adjustments need to be made around our language uh, to avoid dysphoria and, and and things like that so there's loads there's absolutely loads but I don't know if I've got the capacity to, <laughs> to do justice to that question my my only little fi final contribution just to that question is um uh and I, I, I'm, I'm always repeating myself on this, but we all have subconscious bias. We all have subconscious bias. We've been raised in a white patriarchy, uh, we, and white supremacy is is alive and real. And it means we all have um, uh, stuff going on that we're not aware of, which means we may subconsciously uh, override the boundaries of certain types of people uh, mm. more often than other types of people. Uh, and this doesn't mean, oh, you're a bad person, you're a sexist, you're a racist, you're this, uh, which is very shaming, labelling language. But if we all start to accept I have subconscious bias in me because I'm a product of this society that I've been raised in, uh, and we're aware of that, we're mindful of that, that means we can start to make choices to stop letting those situations happen. Uh, like like Jeremy said, being mindful of who's in the room and who's got the voice mm -hmm. um, and who's being heard. Yeah, we all have some desires. It's okay. <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> Gorgeous. And and the last question for tonight, and uh, it's it's from the chat. Uh, how do you ground yourself or bring yourself back if you feel like you've made a mistake. Mm. Something has happened. You haven't dealt with that uh, in a good way as a teacher or facilitator. How do you ground yourself after that? Mm. Can I share a mantra I've been using? I gave to Lucy the other day as well. Um, I'm obsessed with Brené Brown, um, who's a wonderful shame and vulnerability researcher um that I'd really recommend if you haven't seen her where I've been listening to a lot of her podcasts unlocking us recently which is really accessible and she talks to a lot of a very um inclusive and diverse range of people that she talks to in interviews um the mantra she has is I'm here to get it right I'm not here to be right so when we make a mistake mm. as a facilitator we don't catch something or we override something oh my gosh it, we, the shame can just <gasps> 
and but we because we 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 want to be a good person we want to be right where oh my god we're always right where we go to inclusivity classes we um we donate money to charity and all these little this shame spiral can happen and we can become defensive and for me i'm here to get it right i'm not here to be right can really help uh as long as well uh, deep breathing you know and for me there's two situations where we get triggered i get triggered if yes yeah, something's gone wrong i've made a mistake um, and I also get highly triggered if I'm if I observe a situation that is personally triggering for me. So you know, sexism really gets gets my gears because I've experienced lots of it. Um, overriding of personal physical things because I've got some physical boundaries, um, uh, and I'm aware that as a teacher I can then come on harsher with that incident because it triggers me. So I have to be mindful. Oh, that's one of my triggers. Uh, I'm going to go into professional mode and just deal with it like a professional and not like um, not like I'm out in a bar and a man's just slapped the bum of my friend when I would like not pun maybe maybe punch him in the face you know but you can't do that when you're a teacher um <laughs> wear an appropriate hat so you can have the appropriate response but yeah the main takeaway is breathing and I'm here to get it right I'm not here to be right uh, to be fine I haven't discovered how to do it. I just go into a little shame bubble for about 24 hours and uh, feel feel awful and probably like over talk it. Oh, and then like tr learning to just apologize and move on and not basically seek that person to do the work for you to make you feel better. Is again, getting the head, like saying sorry, meaning that you're sorry and then and maybe maybe you can ask for some learning if you're not going to emotionally tax the other person by doing that but otherwise just get the hell out of their way I you know I, I got somebody's pronouns wrong the other day and apologized um uh and apologized in the group as well because I wanted everyone to see that I was like owning up to it because I wanted them to feel, but even after that I just felt crap you know um but I thought rather than badgering that person to make to make me feel lighter I just needed to get out of their way because they're having to deal with people possibly getting their pronouns wrong more than I'm having to deal with the shame of getting their pronouns wrong if you see what I mean um but but yeah yeah <laughs> uh yeah I have a really hard time if I cross someone's boundaries or I've hurt someone unintentionally um which implies that I hurt people intentionally that's not what I mean either. <laughs> but yeah, I also go into a shame spiral. Um, but it's important for me to, it's more important than feeling shame is to, to apologize. Uh, as you've said, the two of you have said, um, it's really important for me if I, if I can apologize right then and there to just apologize and, and depending on, you know, the, I'm happy to apologize at any time, depending, you know, not depending on anything. Like, is it, is it, is it a severe thing? Is it a, not a big deal? Regardless, I'm happy to say, I'm really sorry. Or because uh, if I feel it and I feel like it's important to say it, it should be said. Mm -hmm. um, also, though, not making it about me. I think that's such a good point, Lucy. Like, I'm pointing. Uh, it's such a good point because it's not about me. It's about, I want to, it's about you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I still haven't, the, the times that I've, I'm aware that I've crossed someone's boundaries or, or I've hurt someone, I, have a really hard time letting it go there are times that i still think about so um perhaps i'll start listening to brene brown podcasts <laughs> i was just thinking just listening to talk about apologizing uh there's a two-parter on apologies and making them matter with a psychologist called harriet Lerner that i cannot remember uh, recommend more and because there's so much we have so much baggage around apologizing and accepting apologize, apologies and the word sorry 
because also sometimes our default is to go sorry 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 when we've hurt someone without really hearing the, mm. the pain without really seeing what yeah. it is done and apologizing and this masterclass blew my mind I was like oh my gosh why didn't I have this years ago so yeah Harriet Lerner and Brené Brown and knocking as podcast oh Yay. <laughs> yeah i don't want to give the impression that i'm running around going sorry 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 oh i don't uh, believe you are but, I was, I was uh, but uh yeah so i have my pen out so. <laughs> um yes I was, yeah i'm so with you on apologizing in the moment uh if if you're able and it's appropriate and I was projecting when I said the sorry, 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 which is one of my things I'm working on. <laughs> oh, I feel like I need to apologize right now for what? For, for having to close this, this wonderful conversation <laughs> because I want to stay with you and keep on going, but it's, it's getting uh, late in um, at least in our time zones. So uh, I would like to thank you Three for taking your time for sharing so many wonderful tips and ideas and so many resources like actually practical things um, from from podcasts to to the tools that we can use in the moment. I would like to thank everybody in the chat for commenting and and also helping each other out. Like I, I can see people having wonderful discussions and just replying to each other. Uh, yay, thank you so much. And maybe we can continue this conversation in, I don't know, next year, in five years, and we will be on a completely different level where intimacy in improv is a thing. And we discuss our boundaries as a matter of fact, and everybody's happy. Yay, thank you so much, and um, good night. Bye. Thank you for putting it together, Arena. <laughs> Yeah, thank you to everybody for watching because it's yeah. so heartening to see other people who care about this. Please reach out, please reach out. I'd love to chat to anybody who's interested in this stuff. Yes. Hooray! Hooray. <laughs>